good job. It's your boy Ross back at again with another video. So we're going to check out 10 wrestling match types that were never used again. Now, in wrestling, times change. Just like in everything else that you see on, me you know, on social media or in media in general, things have to change with the time. And you would have certain matches that worked in the early 90s that won't work as well in today's climate. For example, the Braun Panty matches. That would not work. I'm going to tell you that now. That is the quickest way for people to be ready to cancel the show because it's objectifying women to just a bra and panties match. Was it cool seeing it as a kid? Yes. But in hindsight, did it really do anything for the female wrestlers? No. So, I can see maybe those being one of the type of like matches that they get rid of. So, we're going to check this out, man. Appreciate all the love and support on the channel. You guys have been running it up like crazy. And let's get right into this one. The roots of wrestling date back to the side shows of the 19th century, where average Joes would try to outshoot grapplers in the hopes of winning cash and adulation. The business soon evolved and it became a global attraction as the the theatrical element was ramped up while the legitimate Apple. sporting side of it was downplayed. To keep the audiences coming back and to heighten the stakes, feuds were established and gimmick matches were slowly introduced. From the steel cage and the Texas mm -hmm. death match through to contemporary gimmicks like Hell in a Cell and TLC, when a promoter struck gold with a match type, it could usually be relied upon to bring in some extra box office and often became part of a promotion's legacy. Mm -hmm. But not every experiment can be a success. For every TLC, there is a due Bagwell on a forklift match. For every what? Hell in a Cell, there is a Punjabi prison. Oh, yeah. Whether through a lack of foresight, bad timing, or elements yeah. beyond anyone's the control. Punjabi prison, it, it looked cool. It sounded cool. But it really, in actual practice, wasn't very that. It wasn't that cool. Oh, there are a bunch of match types that occurred once and then sank without trace, never to be tried again. I'm Adam Pachisi from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 wrestling match types that were never used again. Join us. Number 10, The Asylum. Hmm. Ah, Dean Ambrose oh, with his little fringe and sweaty vest and his silly face. Boy, was he a wacky character. A million miles removed from the brooding, violent John Moxley, Ambrose was a watered-down Brian Pillman who yep. was eventually morphed into a quirky, cool guy with an edge. While feuding with Chris Jericho in I 2016, Ambrose introduced several new elements to his character, most notably being friends with a potted plant called Mitch. After Jericho killed Mitch, their feud <laughs> went up another level, and a new match was created to house their barbaric insanity, the Asylum. As a concept, the Asylum isn't bad. A cage match featuring a plethora of weapons attached to the top and sides where escaping wouldn't end things. The object of the match was for the participants to just wail on each other until one could get a pinfall or submission. Mm -hmm. The problem was there was just a bit too much going on and it felt a little, you know, Russo. Look, either have a hardcore match or have a cage match. There was no need to combine the two. The bout itself wasn't terrible, but the crowd were dead and everything was overshadowed by a potted plant, like a dodgy sequel to The Little Shop of Horror. <laughs> they really went with the potted plant gimmick. They were not letting that go. <laughs> Number nine, Armageddon Hell in a Cell. What's better than a Hell in a Cell match? That's right, a six-man mm -hmm. Hell in a Cell match. Legendary Despite numerous match. appearances in WWE video games through the years, the six-man cell only happened once at mm -hmm. Armageddon 2000. It was all Mick Foley's fault. The hardcore icon was commissioner at the time, and having seen WWE champion Kurt Angle weasel his way through matches against The Undertaker, Triple H, Steve Austin, The Rock, and Rikishi, Mick decided to throw all six under one roof and let the carnage unfold. Mr. McMahon hated the idea, trying valiantly to get all six competitors to drop out to no avail. Instead, the caveat was inserted that if anyone got injured, Foley would be fired. What we got was prime attitude era intensity. Mm -hmm. People were bleeding everywhere you looked, finishers were hit left, right, and center, and Vince turned up with a hay-filled wagon to try and tear the cell down. Just great stuff. The problem was that it was hard to know where to look, especially as Rikishi and Taker pummeled each other up on the roof before Fatu plummeted into the truck below. It was memorable, it was mm -hmm. anarchic, but a one-on-one -on -one cell match usually works far better with a third of the effort. I ain't gonna lie to you. I'm okay with a six-man Hell in a Cell because these were the top guys. I'm okay with it. 
and I'm glad they didn't do it anymore. It only needed to be one time. That was an iconic moment. It was just so much chaos. I loved it. I loved it, me personally. I think it's one of the 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 better Hell in the Cell matches. It's not the best, in my opinion, but it's one of the better ones because it was just so much going on. So many stories were being told. I enjoyed it. Number eight, Sumo Monster Truck Match. Huh? Throughout the ages, there have been many gimmick matches that have gone down in history. The Ric Flair versus Kerry Von Erich cage match, for example. Shawn Michaels versus Undertaker inside Hell in a Cell, another. Mm -hmm. But none hold a candle to the ultimate sporting contest. Hulk Hogan versus the Giants in a monster truck match. Quite possibly the most 90s wrestling thing that ever happened, yeah. the monster truck match came about because Dungeon of Doom's rampaging rookie ran over Hogan's motorbike with a truck and laughed like a horse before for driving off. Of course, the two signed on to have a monster truck battle, aka a boring sumo wrestling match featuring ridiculous giant cars. Hogan's had arms, giants look Yeah, this is definitely a 90s thing. This I love me some monster trucks, don't get it twisted. Monster trucks and wrestling back then? Sign me the fuck up. Whoever went to a monster jam, comment down below. I remember going to a monster jam a few times as a kid. It was the best experience of my life. But uh yeah, this is definitely a 90s thing. This would not work <laughs> in today's climate. It looked like a spooky no. skeleton. And Eric Bischoff clearly spent far too much money on the whole thing. The match, if you can call it that itself, was just five minutes of trucks going forwards and backwards and somehow ended with Hogan accidentally murdering a man when he pushed Giants off the top of Kobo Hall. How this got greenlit is honestly beyond me. Actually, wait, no, it's not. It was 1995 WCW where the big boys threw enough mess at the wall and hoped that some of it would stick. Mm -hmm. This mess clearly didn't. Number seven, the Piranha Death Match. What? Deathmatch wrestling is hardly sane at the best of times, but during it- Who remember when we used to watch C uh, CZW on a, in a clutch page? Crazy time. <laughs> we definitely can't do that now. We may have to check it out on Patreon, but we cannot do that on YouTube now. It's 90s heyday. It often went completely off the deep end. Yep. Hardcore pioneers FMW were the trendsetters with such weird match types like the grocery store death match, electrified barbed wire exploding ring cage match, and the <laughs> incredibly named barbed wire electrified dynamite pool double hell death match. What? Looks nice on a marquee, doesn't what it? The hell? It was rival <laughs> Big Japan Pro Wrestling that promoted the most bizarre death match of all the yokohama amazon river piranha death match or simply piranha death match if you prefer the object of the match was to submerge your opponent in a tank of ill-tempered piranhas sort of like a casket match but what? criminally insane to make it more violent there were barbed wire boards set up in corners of the ring but who really cared because piranhas in the end, Kendo Nagasaki got the win, and loser Mitsuhiro Matsunaga ended up with a small hole in his chest from where the little fishy fellas nibbled him like a big blood-soaked buffet. Oh, no. Due to the unpredictability of wild animals and the viciousness of the piranhas themselves, never mind the possibility that it could be easily conceived as animal cruelty, the piranha deathmatch never caught on. Uh, I'm glad it didn't catch on. That's uh, it's taking a little bit too far in my number opinion. six the doomsday cage match mid-90s pre-nw definitely some of these matches i was didn't even know was the thing. most rubbish place more cartoony than a flintstones marathon it was a company where seemingly every heel wanted nothing more than to end hulk hogan though to be fair who could blame them Heading into Uncensored 1996, the alliance to end Hulkamania was formed. Comprising Ric Flair, Arn Anderson, Meng, Barbarian, Lex Luger, Taskmaster, Z Gangster, and a massive lad called The Ultimate Solution, they decided the way to destroy Hogan was by beating the Hulkster and best frenemy Randy Savage in a doomsday cage match. Three cages stacked on top of each other. The aim was to fight from the top to the bottom, where the match could be ended by pinfall. Each cage featured different opponents, but still, it was eight against two. It went about as well as you would imagine, and what? was, to put it kindly, an absolute mess of a match. For starters, the structure was by the entrance and bathed in weird lighting, so no one in the arena could actually see what was going on. And secondly, the storyline was woefully stupid. What Hogan the hell? and Savage won the match, of course, thanks to booty man Ed Leslie giving them frying pans to use as weapons. What was I saying about the Flintstones earlier? The Triple Cage had several designs and appearances through WCW, but it was never deployed as 
woefully as it was here. Wow, five, I didn't even know that. Baby wow. Wrestling is all about making your stars look great, whether they win or lose, or at least it should be. There is a victory and defeat when done right, and a spirited mm -hmm. loss against a formidable opponent can turn your average Joe into a huge deal. The reverse is also true, and there are few better examples than when rookie underdog The Kid defeated Razor Ramon on Raw in 1993. It was a huge deal, and the rechristened 123 Kid became a player. Eventually, he was turned heel, because why not, and a renewed feud with Razor saw their roles reversed. With so much history between the two, there was only one suitable stipulation. The crybaby match. What? Yeah, the crybaby match. A regular match where the loser got their bum covered up with a big nappy because nothing says tough wrestler like being made to look like an incontinent child. It was similar to the weasel suit matches that Bobby Heenan made famous. But Heenan was a cowardly heel manager, not a hot young wrestler who could have been groomed into a main eventer had they been presented and pushed differently. A we what in the hell? Yeah, that definitely, definitely sounds like a Vince McMahon kind of thing. Cause uh, that don't even what that a crybaby match. Um. Wow. Weird immature stipulation that could have only happened during the new generation era. It's miraculous that the one two three kid managed to come back from this. Number four, the last rights match. No list of one-off match types would be complete without an appearance from everyone's favorite train-loving bro, Vince Russo. During one of his many spells in TNA, Russo oversaw a bonkers feud between Abyss and Sting, all centered around the fact that Abyss shot his own dad. What stakes could possibly end this immense piece of human drama? A last rights match. A match that saw plastic candlesticks adorning the turnbuckles what? and spooky graveyard crap littered oh around the ring. God. The object was to call a coffin down from the ceiling, put your opponent in it, then raise it back up. Absolute bollocks. What? The match itself was terrible as having a chunky coffin in the middle of a small ring inhibited the wrestler's ability to move freely and easily. Plus, it was traditionally overbooked TNA tripe that saw polystyrene tombstones obliterated and sting gushing blood from a candelabra shot. The fans Jeez. obviously turned on the match, chanting Fire Russo so loudly and passionately that Mike Tanay and Don West had to practically scream on commentary to try wow. to drown them out. Needless to say, the last rights match was never attempted again and it has gone down as one of the worst matches matches in TNA history. Yeah, when your commentators are have to, they have to yell over the crowd saying fire Russo, that's not a good sign. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> that's that not a good sign. Some at all. Ground, let me tell you. Number 3, the King of the Road. Even though mid-90s WCW had morphed into a kid-friendly cartoonish wrestling federation, it still had one foot in wrestling and wanted to keep their remaining fans from the NWA days happy. Sounds like a good climate to promote an event called Uncensored then, WCW's annual extreme pay-per-view where all matches were anything goes including the King of the Road match. It pitted Dustin Rhodes versus the Blacktop Bully, better known as Demolition Smash. The two had been feuding for a while and it all led to this, a brawl in the back of Bully's 18-wheeler. The objective was to fight from the back to the front of the open-air hay-filled trailer, climb the cab and blast an air horn as the truck drove around public roads. The wow. match itself was a weird concept, but was actually a half-decent brawl that saw both competitors blade a huge no-no at the time. Dustin, Bully, and road agent Mike Graham were fired on the spot for going against company policy, oh. and the King of the Road match was never used again. Again, this was on a pay-per-view called Uncensored. If irony were made out of straw- So they bladed it, and they got rid of him on a pay-per-view that said Uncensored. That's insane. The concept of that sounds pretty cool, but it's still- <laughs> What are you doing showing blood? Get out of here. <laughs> Berries, WCW sure would have drank a lot of milkshakes. A blessing in disguise, really, because if not for this match, we probably would have never gotten gold dust. Number two, the Chamber of Horrors. The contributions of Dusty Rhodes to professional wrestling are immeasurable. His run as NWA champion and the mic work from that era influenced countless wrestlers, and his time on the booking committee produced gems like War Games and the infamous Dusty Finish. But not everything Dusty pioneered was gold, especially not the Chamber of Horrors match at Halloween Havoc 1991. 
The Steiners, Sting, and Ellie Gonte taking on Big Van Vader, Abdullah the Butcher, Cactus Jack, and the Diamond Stud at the spookiest event of the year. Sounds great, so what was the stipulation? Simple, the eight men battle it out in a big cage, aiming to lower an electric chair and kill one of their opponents for the win. Mm. Completely normal, that. What? As the raging climax drew near, Abdullah got Rick Steiner in the electric chair as Cactus Jack cheered and acted the fool by the all-important death switch. But oh no! Rick switched with Abdullah and Cactus accidentally murdered his teammates with Abdullah twitching, convulsing, and bleeding buckets as light sparks flew about the place. Abdullah stayed dead for a couple of minutes then got up and beat up a load of weird ghosts. The strangest part? This was the opening match of the pay-per-view. What? I mean, really, where do you go from there? First ever serial killer eight-man tag in the main event? Num I, <laughs> I don't even know what to say to that. Like, <laughs> you have to beat the enemies and force them into an electric chair to kill them? Once again, different time in wrestling. Definitely would not work today. Holy, and that's the opening match? Oh, okay. <laughs> Number one, the kennel from hell. We've talked at length here at Cultaholic about Big Boss Man and Al Snow's infamous rivalry from 1999. Disturbing, over-the-top, genuinely nasty, it wasn't a high point of the Attitude Era. From the horrible Pepper the Dog incident onwards, everything built up towards a huge blow-off, the kennel from hell. A hen on a cell surrounding a traditional blue caged ring with savage guard dogs patrolling in between, this was on course to be a violent blood fest befitting such a heated feud where the first to dodge all that carnage and escape would be Victor. Then the bell rang and it all fell to pieces. The vicious guard dogs were anything but and spent the majority of the match either pooping and peeing everywhere wow. or tracking down each other for a bit of naughty rumpy pumpy. <laughs> Doggy style, obviously. Needless <laughs> to say, it completely undermined mind the stakes of the match, and by the time Al Snow escaped and finally vanquished Big Boss Man, nobody cared. They were too busy laughing at dogs having a shag. So the dogs <laughs> said, hey, fuck this. We're about to get it in. <laughs> That's funny. The dogs weren't even vicious. They were just, shit, we about to, we about to get it in, man. What's up, baby? <laughs> Take me out to dinner. <laughs> Yo, that was that was crazy, man. A lot of these matches I didn't even know was a thing, and this was very interesting. I, I like videos like this where I found out something new about wrestling from back in the day, man. So I like this. This was cool. This was dope. Comment down below. Let me know what was the most shocking match type uh, from this video. For me, it's the, uh, the electrocution match. <laughs> you gotta defeat your opponent in a cage to lower another cage to put them in an electric chair to kill them in that said cage i'm i'm done that that one was very extreme very roguish but uh appreciate all love and support road to 70k appreciate y'all kicking it with me see y'all in the next one peace